Hello, welcome back to another episode of Collider Jedi Council. I'm Christian Harloff, a.k.a. Darth Harloff, back in the house today. No! And just for today. Just for today. Because I am preparing for my match with Andy Signor tomorrow. I need to channel the dark side. So today on the council, I would like to fill filling in for Mark 2D2. He's back again. It's Roca Fett. John Roca is here. Hey guys, thanks for having me back on. I'm looking forward to talking about Star Wars with you guys. A lot of stuff to get to, so uh, let's get going. She's yelling at me for embracing the dark side, <laughs> although she is the Smith Lord, Tiffany Smith. Hi, Welcome I'm happy back. to be back. Yeah. I'm so happy to be back. I was yelling at you because you got onto Snapchat and you're Harloff Minor on there. I feel yes. like you're embracing the new name and now you're like, oh, maybe I want to go back. No. Well, if you were no. here last Somebody week. Somebody maybe gave him a hard time. Some about that. <laughs> <laughs> and the person from the origin of giving me a hard time on Harloff Minor, he is Obi John Kenobi, John Campia. I like things. <laughs> yeah, well, then it is not that John Campion. That is Campion. the bold, most bold faced yeah. lie you've ever yeah, said on this is, panel. That is not John Campion. Who is this imposter? What have you done with John Campion? We'll find out it's in a just clone. a bit. Stop doing my voice. Uh, we're going to move Wrong on show, guys. to show. the first topic here, which is is simply Star Wars movie news. Everything happening in the world of the movies, whether it be any of the standalone spin-off films or the trilogy, we talk about it in the movie news. Roka, a lot of yeah. stuff going down. Yeah, yeah, a lot of stuff. Let's, let's just jump into it with the Rogue One saga. I'm going to do my best to encapsulate it so we can talk about it, but... As you all know, or some of you have been reading, you all know there's some uh, reshoot stuff going on with with uh, Rogue One, so let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucasfilm is saying now, they've commented to EW a few times, this is from ScreenRant.com, they talk about the fact that they only had a screening for Lucasfilm employees and the and Disney hit honchos Bob Iger and Alan Horn. They were the only ones to see the first edit, apparently, and they said they were pleased, they're just trying to make a good movie great. That was the point of these reshoots. But then stuff started coming out with these rumors that 40% of the movie was going to be reshot, that 50% of the movie was going to be shot, according to Latina Review. Then Christopher McQuarrie supposedly was being noted as being involved, and a slash... The Slash Film guys came back and, and said that they, they cleared it up because McCory responded to them. McCory saying he's only like coming in as an advisor. He's not coming in to reshoot the film. Then Tony Gilroy got involved uh, because they are trying to lock the film down for its release date. And so there's a lot of rumors about all this stuff going on. Christian, what do you think about all these different moving parts in this situation. It's so funny because you like you you covered a lot, yet you just scratched the surface yeah. because there's more stuff about that apparently that the Darth Vader scene, there was a shot of him cutting down rebels the same way he did in Bloodline and Bloodline in uh, Battlefront um, Twilight Company, the book and that they toned it down. And then there was reports that it said like Alan Horn, who was notorious for making things more family friendly, was one of the ones who was just like, oh, let's scale back. I don't know if this is, this is more of a uh, family friendly thing. This is too dark. We won't get that young audience. And then they tone it down. Then there's, like you said, the, the reshoots. And what I think, when we initially talked about this report, whether it was last week or the week before, um, that, it, it, that I still say reshoots happen. We know that they happen on films, but there's a lot of talk, so much talk now that it's not just a, hey, it's reshoots, let it go. There's so many different reports that you'd have to think some things are true. Now, whether or not that means it's a mess or not, you can debate that all day long. I just think there's more going on than maybe Disney wants you to. You got to take the Entertainment Weekly report with a grain of salt because they are big proponents for yeah. Disney. They get all the scoops from them. They do all the panels for them. So right. that's a little bit of PR help right there, and, and that's fine. It makes sense. It's a big, it's a big outlet. It's a big junk. It's a big voice. So go for it. Um, I, I, I'm going to say that I probably think that they are going to cut some of the Vader stuff down, to which displeases me a little bit. I hope that they put it out on extended scenes and other things too. There's other reports that apparently Edwards is, is very upset that they took away his vision, but then there's other reports that he's kind of done again. I don't know how you guys feel about Godzilla. I was not a big fan of it. I thought that what he did well was the action scene at the end, and apparently that's what's really good in Rogue One, but the stuff I didn't like in Godzilla with, with characters I didn't care about was a, apparently a problem here. Mm. Hearsay, not sure. Mm. All my point is, I think it is possible that there's more going on that Disney is is giving EW. Tiff, what do you think? Listen, even if they're worried, they're not going to come out and say, yeah, we were a little bit worried. We got to do some reshoots. So them coming out and saying, we've got to make a good movie great. 
there's nothing else they could possibly say. I feel like if they came out and said nothing, then it's like, they're, like you were saying, Christian, there's so many rumors coming out about reshoots and other people coming in to check things out and rework things here and there that everyone would have been like, well, you're totally lying because we know that there are reshoots happening. And the fact that it's gone from, I don't know, I think at first it was like, six weeks of reshoots now like four weeks of reshoots but six days a week that they're shooting um it just it does worry me a little bit because i think initially when rogue one was talked about when the footage that they showed at um star wars celebration came out and it was so dark and so war focused that it was like okay we're gonna get something totally different and that's what we all have talked about as fans saying when they do the Star Wars story, when they do the anthology, whatever they're deciding to call them, <laughs> um, that we want it to have a different feel than the episodes. And now it's sounding like, wait, we're getting a little scared. We're going to lose out on some money. We want to make sure that it's as close to the episodes as possible so we right. can get more fans in. And that's disappointing to me because, as you were saying, I agree with Godzilla. I did not love that movie. Um, I think that it was lacking the interaction between the characters. There was no real development there. So... I don't know how much Gilroy had to do with trying to up that or if like what he did was where we ended up. But if it's about the interpersonal relationships between the characters that feels lacking, like, yeah, I want more of that. But if they're talking about familyizing hmm. <laughs> the movie, I don't really want that. I yeah. want it to feel different. So it's it's I, like I said, I'm a little bit worried about it. Campia, so I'm curious because we haven't really spoke since more of these reports have come out. Right. Because I know you and I were pretty much on the same page when this initial report came out. Have you changed your line of thinking at all? You're like, nope, still the same thing. Reshoots are reshoots. It's it's what it is. It, it, it changed slightly from being a four, four, four and a half foot pile of horse manure to a five, six foot tall pile of horse manure. More, oh, this is all nonsense. So. Really? Wow. It's okay. all nonsense. Look, hmm. let's just run down the scorecard for a second, okay? Please. Report comes out. Disney begins unplanned that was the first word right. unplanned shoots debunked totally debunked that was false mm -hmm. disney came out they showed you the sheets we had it budgeted we had it scheduled and we already had the actors booking the time off in advance we always planned on doing this like we do with our marvel films like dc's doing with the dc films that next rumor comes out christopher mccrory has taken over the reshoots he has taken over from gareth edwards completely debunked. Macquarie himself came out and said, this is total nonsense. I have not taken over anything. I'm barely involved, all right? So that's been completely debunked. Next rumor comes out. Test audience screenings were shown to several test audiences with major concerns, blah, blah. Totally debunked. There were no audience test screenings. None of them happened. With this track record, why would anybody, why would anybody take any of these rumors that come flying out Seriously, at all. Then this rumor comes out, they're reshooting 40% of the movie. Quick phone call to the PR people at Disney. Is this true? Total nonsense. All I needed to know. Total nonsense. And so with this track record, 0 for 5 as far as I'm concerned about all these rumors, none of them coming from any official source, by the way. A couple of them coming from that tried and true reliable source of anonymous posters on Reddit. I'm not lying. Look, check it out. A couple of these rumors, that's where they get their origin from. Why? Why do? Why does anybody take any of this seriously? Now, in the midst of a hailstorm, um, you're bound to find one chunk of hail shaped in the face of the Virgin Mary. It's just, it's, <laughs> oh, wow. it's bound to happen. I was like, where in the world <laughs> is this going? It's bound to happen. Right. So in the midst of like 500 of these rumors you spread there, could it be true that maybe they decided, hey, you know, we had this one Darth Vader scene, and when his lightsaber cuts the guy, his intestines come sp spilling out, we decided to tone that back a bit. Could, could that be true? Sure. Absolutely. But at this point, considering how much stuff has already been completely disproved, why anybody would take any of these things that don't come from Edwards himself, uh, Disney themselves, Lucasfilm themselves, as being true is completely beyond me. Like, again, this is only because the track record so far is everything has been completely debunked. But so that's why not believe true. anything new? Everything's not been debunked because, yes, there are reshoots happening, they're changing stuff. Macquarie and Gilroy have both Always been, been brought a part in of the to plan. do stuff. Yep. The reshoots have been part of the plan, but bringing two other people in to even 
if it's like have a little bit of hands on it. I mean, th there's stuff that's going on that. But Disney was has done not. that with their Marvel films too. Like even when they do their Two Marvel research, people, they will bring in teams of different people at the end for research. Absolutely. Actually, as a matter of fact, they even did that with Thor Ragnarok. Like going all the way back to Thor Ragnarok Which, when they brought in like. Her, we're, mean, we're, not, I was like, right. sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, Thor yeah. Dark World. Yeah, Dark World. I'm yeah. trying to think of positive but, things. But that's not a hard, Dark World. <laughs> that's a hard example because that movie for a lot uh, wasn't Didn't really received. I know, but I'm saying if you even go all the way back to that. Disney has a tracker where they didn't just bring in Joss Whedon to do resheets. They brought in a team of five or six other people with Josh to sit down, go over stuff, just to get as many eyes as possible on it. And go. that's just how long they've been doing this for. For Disney, this is par for the course. This is their standard operating procedure with every film they've done so far. What do you think? I want to believe, John. I want to believe what you're saying. I want to believe that it is is nothing and you debunked and everything's... But some of the sources are people we know personally, like Peter Serretta over at Slash. He would not report this stuff if it, if it caused problems, I think, for his website. I think he would source it out to the point where it had to be sourced out correctly. Because as much well, sometimes as... Sometimes sites make mistakes yeah, and he do. even said it with McCrory. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, but they I, corrected... Like Peter corrected did, yeah. his own mistake. Exactly. Because exactly. that's, that's how meant. much integrity Peter has. Right. Exactly, right. exactly. And so, but I, I think it would be shocking to me that some of these sites, like Latina Review, would risk this kind of backlash against themselves. Are you telling me Latina Review? It's, it's hard to believe that Latina Review, and I'm friends with the guys over there, but come on. Are you telling me the guys with Latina Review would never report something <laughs> that wasn't rock solid well, gospel? I, I feel like you've got to have a certain reputation that you, you're sourcing stuff out to the point where you feel comfortable posting it. And I feel like Latina Review has done, is more often than <laughs> not to an almost 85 to 90% ratio correct on the stuff they report and I like reading them and believe them most of the time when they post the stuff they report my thing is this there is a lot of smoke here whereas it's standard stuff to see a couple of couple of brush fires this feels like it's building to a crescendo the yeah. fact they're saying 50% that's a strong statement 40% was strong enough but jump it up to 50 mm -hmm. it's just scary to me that we're seeing a lot of these reports and you're saying Gareth Edwards possibly you know being upset that they're doing this or no, he's not upset and this idea of Godzilla I personally like the film but you're both are right the character development wasn't great the tone was fantastic I was looking forward to that mm -hmm. but it sounds to me that's what they're trying to clean up possibly the interactions and Macquarie can say no no I didn't do this I didn't do that but we don't personally know right Disney can be like please come out and make a statement blah 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 and sure I'll do but it but that's What's what it comes down to though isn't it right, right. it Who comes do down to this is yes. that Disney is Disney the actual source is saying mm -hmm. this is the case mm -hmm. Macquarie is saying this is the case Gareth Edwards is still like posting pictures yeah. of the stuff he's doing You're that right. is the case to believe anything else you left with nothing but I'm just choosing to believe it like with anything else but sure. there's nothing rock solid foundational to say because all the actual sources are saying that's not true that's not true that's not true right. meanwhile we've got some sites saying we hear that this is happening what do you choose to believe now, is it, wait, real quick is it is it because because like look at something like Suicide Squad which also big stink once they were doing the reshoots mm -hmm. for it but started which also was nonsense by the way but, but, but even so right but started to die down pretty quick yeah. after it went up and there was some discussion not like this yeah now the question be, I was, I was gonna, that, that's, yeah. that's what i was gonna <laughs> ask point, now yeah. the, the question is is it a because it's star wars or b a possibility that there actually is some stuff now whether or not the maybe they started they had those reshoots like you said the reshoots were planned they were done but how much they were going to mm -hmm. shoot um, that wasn't maybe planned. So maybe there is a, a 50% or that they're doing, and maybe it is because one of the reports is that the Macquarie script wasn't, it wasn't a matter of them saying, oh, you have to do, you have to do this because this movie is just not working. It was because Edwards was shooting at a schedule that the Macquarie script wasn't done at the time. So now that it is done, they want, they liked what Macquarie finished with and they want to go back and finish that stuff. And it happened to be about 40, 50% because they said they didn't from the, these reports, whether it's BS or, not if you believe them it's that the action is is great mm -hmm. they want to go with the action they like what they shot with the action but it's the character development the story that macquarie apparently helped with so mm -hmm. do you think that there's an option that it's not just because it's star wars it's because there is a little bit more detail to the reshoots well here this is something that we you and i had said before right you have to keep this in mind is that when, and it's not just Star Wars, by the way, the suffering. It, like Captain America: Civil War, the reshoot news got out, and people started pr right. prophesying right. doom and gloom for Captain America: Suicide Squad. World War Z. People saying, "Oh, we're hearing oh, yeah, this World is a mess." World War Z was a different situation because that was the movie did it. fall mm -hmm. fall apart, yeah. Yeah. and they had to re, re put and it back it ended together up being again. Right. But mm -hmm. since that time, studios now, like back in the olden days, 
2010 and <laughs> earlier. Back in the olden days, movie. this is what the movie studios faced. They had a script, they storyboarded, they had a budget, they shot, and then they put it together as best they could in the editing room because at that point, the money's gone. You can't remake the movie. You can't get another $50 million from the studio. And then, so you would live with what you live with. But quite often, and this is the, the struggle that filmmakers, studios, editors have all faced all the time. What, when you get something in a script and you envision what it's gonna look like and you put it in storyboards, quite often, once you cut it to film and see it in live action, oftentimes it doesn't come across the same way that you envisioned it coming across on the page. Now, for the history of Hollywood, you just gotta live with that. Edit it together as good as you can in the editing room to get it as close to the field you wanted. That's why George Lucas goes back 15 years later once he had all the money in the world and did 15 different right. versions of a special But edition. look how that... I know, no, I'm so saying. But, that, but that's <laughs> that what filmmakers out. face, right? But today now, you have these massive <laughs> film franchises that aren't just standalone films. These right. are now segments in a franchise that have 100, 150, 200 million dollar budgets where they go, they now say it's not good enough for us to just shoot it and hope it turns out the way we thought it would on screen. We want to shoot it, get a cut of it together. This is what DC does now. This is what Marvel does now. This right. is what Star Wars does now. We want to get a cut together, then sit back, see how it's all coming together, get new ideas, get fresh ideas, and say, how can we now make this even better? And then they make those notes and they go in for those reshoot mm -hmm. dates that they had already budgeted and already mm -hmm. scheduled and already set the actors aside to go in and make those improvements. It's not a telltale sign that, oh my God, the Captain America Civil War shot must shoot must have been terrible because they're going back for reasons. No, since they shot it, they looked at the first cut and they said, how can we make this even better? How can we fine tune this to the way we really want to do it? Now let's go in and do it. I absolutely believe there are changes they're making mm -hmm. to, to uh, Rogue One. I absolutely do. But I also absolutely believe those changes are a result of watching the first cut going, okay, this didn't work the way we thought it would. This one worked even better than we thought it would. What can we add to this? Because now you can't just think about this movie. You're thinking about the franchise as a whole. Right. So what can we do it to make it even better? And I just believe that is what we're looking at with this. But I think that just opens the door for a lot of scary stuff down the line. Because what sure. if the movie comes out and they're like, oh wait, like a year later, we want to change this thing on a new release of it. Kind of what happened with Star Wars with George mm. Lucas. And I feel like there is something to be said where it's like when these directors and artists are making these movies where it's like, I, as a fan, like obviously want to have my voice heard in some ways. At the same time, I don't want my voice heard so much that it doesn't become that director's film anymore, that it becomes something that like we have put our stamp on now. It's like all garbled and it Fantastic doesn't feel like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't feel like what they actually wanted the movie to be. And that's what worries me about this, because it sounds like and I don't know what the truth is, and it'll be really interesting when the film comes out if we're like, oh, that wasn't great. I wonder what the other version, if there was a different version of it, would have been like. But it's it's worrisome because I don't want them to go in, like I was saying earlier, and be like, oh, we want to make more money. We've got to, like, child-proof this movie yeah. right. because I want I want to see Darth Vader. We've talked about this. I want to see Vader be the Vader that we read in the books. Right. I want to see Vader do the things that lead up to where we see him picking up in Star Wars. So I just... It just worries me. And I know that there are things where it's like there are always reshoots. There's always this kind of stuff going on. And it is a very different time because people can find out so much more and get it out to the public so much faster. So there are things where it's like you got to take everything with a grain of salt. But there is a lot, a lot coming out here that just feels like, OK, it's a little bit more than just a regular thing. And if you're talking about it being is it because it's Star Wars versus something like Suicide Squad? I think there are obviously there are more eyes on Star Wars. But there are a lot of eyes on Suicide Squad because of how BVS did. Right. And people are like, this is the this is like make or break. If this movie is awesome, then you know, DC still has their like chance to live up to Marvel. So I think a lot of eyes were on that when people started talking about reshoots and being worried about that. So I mean, I think that people are obviously gonna be way more fired up about Star Wars because it's been around for so long and has permeated pop culture so much. But I still think that there is truth in there somewhere and I'm hoping for the best from it. Like as a fan, I'm like, I want the best to come out of this obviously, but I'm a little worried. Yeah, because you want that you want the reshoots. If the reshoots were being done because they wanted to incorporate Han Solo more, they wanted to throw in a, a little more Vader, all that kind of stuff. You want to have mm -hmm. a cameo because they keep saying they're gonna have a character right. show up in the film from the past. So you want a legendary character. That's this that would have been a positive approach to the reshoots. You'd be like, oh, that's great, they're going back to the but this seems like there's so much smoke. And I'm with you, Tiffany. I do not want 
a safer, nicer, kid-friendly Star Wars. The, the Star Wars stories were supposed to purposely be different in tone mm -hmm. than the chapters. And there was a reason for that because they wanted to expand the universe, put their toe into different genres, types for Star Wars because Star Wars is such an expansive property with so many planets, so many species. And you brought species. in a director that's known for that. Well, right, let's not, let's exactly. Not, and that's, a... that, I don't want to lose that. Whatever the reshoots are, but reshoots, uh, Johnson, if their schedule reshoots, great, do them well, do well, make a great movie, great. But don't take away that hardcore tone yes, that I and, was looking forward to. And let's not get ahead of ourselves and just think because they're making edits to, like John said, mm. someone's mm -hmm. intestines getting cut out. That's a, you know that, that <laughs> means that it's going to change the tone of the film. True, true. It just means it's going to change the imagery somewhat because it's hard to well unless you do fifty percent of reshoots to change the entire tone of it. But they promoted this at Celebration. I hope this is still the mm -hmm. case. And it was something that got a big pop at the audience, maybe a big cheer at the audience celebration last year when they asked, "Will this be a war film?" They asked. Gareth Edwards, and he said, it's called Star Wars. Yeah. I hope they stick to that. I mm -hmm. feel that they will. All right, okay. that was the Rogue One saga. Certainly, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on there, and I'm sure you guys are chiming in to let your voices be known. John, what's up next? Yeah, uh, well, I guess we're just going to keep going here. Yeah, there's, we a, got. there's a Tony Gilroy rumor that we were, let's address that now, which we kind of touched on a little bit from Blaster.com. According to their, the report they had in EW, in Entertainment Weekly, uh, they're saying that Tony Gilroy, the main writer behind the Jason Bourne franchise is now coming in Winston Wolf-like is the quote from Pulp Fiction uh, coming in to look at the project as a consultant and possibly kind of script doctor the film itself uh, to fit a little bit uh, differently than Godzilla to kind of veer it a little bit away from that um, I mean, who knows what the lengths of the reshoots are actually going to be? And what do you think is the level to which Gilroy would be involved at this point? I'm not going to speculate because I have no yeah. idea. Yeah. I have no idea if he's just giving notes. I have no idea if Macquarie has more of a say or Gilroy or neither one of them. If like John was saying before with Joss Whedon and, and some other people that came in, they gave a couple notes. Here's what we would do. Take them or leave them. Here's our fixes. Here's, you know, here's what we would do with this particular scene. And Gilroy does that. Gilroy is a guy, though, that I think makes some, as does McCory, but I think Gilroy makes some sense to yeah. bring him in because I think that it, it actually enhances and complements Gareth Edwards' mm -hmm. tone for what he's done in the past. So I'd be okay with this. I don't want Edwards to be shoved out to the side, and I don't know if he is or he isn't. I don't think he will be, but I hope that he's able to kind of do his vision and help. Remember also, he's a young director. He's yeah. only done about, this is his third, maybe fourth movie or whatever it is too. So he might be encouraging the help from a guy like Gilroy or a guy like McQuarrie. So we don't know the behind the scenes. We will learn about the behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. About I a year can't later, wait to read that book. That's like, <laughs> we're gonna find all we're gonna, of the stuff that went on behind the scenes. It's the same way we found out about all the Trank stuff. Now, whether or not yeah. we're gonna learn that it's a Trank-like disaster or it's gonna be something that was less and something that was just blown out of proportion, we'll find out. But Tony Gilroy, let's say that it, John it is in fact happening. That this is a guy that's going to be lending his voice. Is he the right guy to be lending voice? He's very, very experienced at this. Mm -hmm. Like he has been like there's a lot of films that he's not credited on. Mm -hmm. He he's been yep. considered a script doctor for a long time. They bring him in to work on projects that a lot of projects. And Kathleen Kennedy has gone to him mm -hmm. a number of times yeah. in the past to bring him in. So if if he's been brought in here that just seems like standard operating procedure for, especially for somebody like Kathleen Kennedy, and it seems like something he'd be very well suited for. Okay. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Christian, in this way that Gilroy comes in and accentuates Edward's vision. Right. They both create these uh, kind of these darker toned, grittier films with overarching feelings of impending doom throughout them. And right. so they, I think it would have. I think this is a more logical thing than McQuarrie. McQuarrie does great action, so maybe they're trying to hype. Maybe they're trying to fix some of the action stuff with McQuarrie and with Gilroy. Maybe more the tone, more the dialogue stuff. They're trying to fix this is but this is again This is a little dangerous for me because once again Here's a young director who was involved with the Star Wars stuff where they might be kind of Kind of messing with their vision a little bit like they did with Josh Trank They literally moved him out bringing in Gareth Edwards if they start messing with it What does this say to younger directors right. that you're walking in going? Hey, just know we're gonna bring in some bigger guns to take a look at your work and see if it's any good And that can be kind of dangerous especially with Trevor sitting there on deck at episode 9 So to me it just it's it's a little I don't mind the Gilroy comes in I'm, I'm excited about that because it means maybe honing the film more like chipping the edges like a sculptor But it concerns me that once we have these things around a young director in the Star Wars franchise yeah. I mean, I think it's, I like the fact that they've worked together before, that they worked yeah. together on Godzilla and that Kathleen Kennedy has worked with him before. That says something good to me because it's like, you look at a director, like you're saying, a young director, and I don't know, maybe they talk to him and we're like, who are some people that you would like oh, to yeah. have come in and take a look that you feel really comfortable with 
looking at your work and saying, okay, this is better. This could be better here. This could be tweaked here. So that to me is interesting. And I like that. Um, and that they're talking a lot more about him rewriting and helping out with some more of the intimate moments between actors where it's like getting more character development. Um, my question is though, I'm like the term script doctor, I feel like, does that usually come in so late in a project? Like I feel like script yeah, doctoring mm -hmm. happens yeah. a lot at the beginning. No, it can happen something like this. Especially for, in the new mm, era of yeah. the big budget films planning their reshoots yeah. later yeah. to come in and say, this is what we have, this is how it's actually manifesting, right. what can we do to improve it at this point? And remember there's also deals that, that studios have a certain people, whether it's a right. Tony yeah. Gilroy or whatever too, like, so where maybe they hire the writer that they have on for the project and the director, and then once a certain point goes, they're not paying them for that anymore, they're bringing on their guy, the guy yeah. that they have a contract yeah. to, can, this is one of the ones who wants you to touch up, yep. and so he touches it up, and, yeah. and there it goes. And generally, if people, maybe people watching don't know, maybe they're younger film watchers or whatever, you script doctors are uncredited people that come mm -hmm. in and take a look at your script and uh, offer different scenes, offer different lines, hone your dialogue, what have you. Patton Oswalt made an entire career of that before. Yeah. Before he blew up as a comic script doctor you can make a whole career out here and never get any credit on mm -hmm. any film but make a nice career doing script doctors right. so yeah. it's good for an up and coming screenwriter well, and it's something that. that when you look at new directors and just like any of our friends who are in the entertainment mm -hmm. industry where it's like you've got your group of friends that you go to where you're like hey can you give this a read yeah. hey right. I'm shooting this thing will you take a look at it where it's like I feel like this happened for so long in Hollywood and now it's become an actual job and not just right now but for a while it's right. been an yeah. actual job and so it's like okay they've worked together before this could just be like his dude and he's like yeah come on in take a look like doors are open yeah. i'm hoping that that's what the case is yeah. all right what's next all right let's move on to uh christopher mccquarrie comments which we kind of touched on as well earlier from starwars.net uh the rumors were postulating that christopher mccquarrie had a hands-on role in the forthcoming rogue a forthcoming rogue one a star wars story reshoots but he denied this vehemently he went on twitter because slash film had reported that an art in their article they described the rumor that as much as 40 percent of rogue one was needing to be reshot they reached out to mccquarrie and mccquarrie to his credit stepped forward and took and said if there are any reshoots on Rogue One I'm not supervising them for any outlet to say so is not only wrong it's irresponsible Gareth Edwards is a talented filmmaker who deserves the benefit of the doubt making a film let alone a Star Wars chapter is hard enough without the internet trying to deliberately downgrade one's years of hard work who does that even serve let him make his movie in peace such a great Twitter statement from McQuarrie uh, he took the Twitter he debunked all the rumors so what do you think about this whole situation with him and Slash Film I think this is a cool story all the way around mm -hmm. because the first part is that McQuarrie coming out letting his voice be heard protecting a fellow filmmaker mm -hmm. Uh, and, and saying this is his vision, let him do his thing, and showing the support that he indeed does have for Edwards and not just staying silent, of like, let him think it, let him think it. He could have he could have done that if he wanted yeah. to. And I think the other part is what we touched on before, is how Peter over at Slash Film also came out and said, well, here's the thing, here's the clarification, and let his voice be heard, and that the, the interaction and the intelligent, uh, classy response they both had in yeah. the way that Peter defended his business. Macquarie also defended his statements, and I thought it was a nice story because I get the frustration of somebody like that to where it's like, well, this is the difference between blogging, and that's journalism, and, and then you have the blogger who's like, well, wait a minute, here's what we did, and here's the things we did wrong, and, and I thought it was a great conversation between the two of them. Yeah. How did you feel about the story? Absolutely. I think it's both both defending their turf, but in a way that's respectful to each other's yeah. business, and I think that's really important. That's how you breed uh, a trust within each other. You know, you can rail against blog journalism versus print journalism or accredited journalism and what have you, the reality is the reality of the world. People are looking at the internet, they're going, they're following these blogs, they're reading these things. You've got to deal with it. It's the real world. Macquarie did a great job of, of very firm, very firm defense of Gareth Edwards, which I think is a very smart, professional thing for him to do. And it just leaves you feeling like, yeah, okay, we can brush away these Macquarie rumors because he came out and was very firm about it. There was no hedge room at all in any of his comments. Like there was no generalized terms right. that would make you think, oh, he's doing a PR spin on it. So I thought it was great. I think something that's. I think this whole Christopher McQuarrie thing becomes a, a study in a microcosm of what all of this Rogue One stuff has yeah. been. Mm -hmm. And there's something very telling. The very top tweet on that graphic. I'll, I'll paraphrase okay. it. But the very top tweet. One of the things McQuarrie says, and this kind of highlights the entire scenario. He says, "Attention, bloggers. I'm reading some horse bleep rumors tonight. You and this is the this is the key thing. You yeah. know where to find me. Do your jobs. What has stunned me in all of this stuff is that, but is that these headlines come out." These rumors come out and nobody bothers to ask the source. Mm. They just don't. Partially because they don't want to ask the source because they don't want to hear the answer they don't want to hear. They want to run their, their sensationalized headlines and get the views and get the clicks and, and say, Rogue One in trouble. 
we, we will, no, did we call Disney and ask them to confirm? No, because they might have said no, and then we can't run our headline. And that's basically what McCrory says here. You know where to find me. Do your jobs. Just call us. Call me and ask. And in the cases of EW, Slash Film, yeah. uh, guys like that, when they do call and get answers, we get answers. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't stop the rumor mill from going. So I love, look, I'm a big fan of Christopher McQuarrie. Mm -hmm. I have been for a while now. He's done some very underrated films and some very celebrated films at the same time. Absolutely. And it, what, Roka, what you said is right on the nose. The way he handled this, he was very careful, I think. Mm -hmm. You can tell he's a writer. Yes. The statement <laughs> was so air sealed rock solid tight yeah. um that there's just no room for uh, getting around it and i thought it was a very classy move on his part Tiff? i mean i think it's there's two different points for me on this one one i agree with what he's saying ask the source but from being going to school for broadcast journalism starting from the ground up and working your way up some people are never going to respond to you. They're going to be bloggers that are trying to reach out and they called and they got no response, no returned email, no returned phone call, no nothing. And so it's like for him to come out and say that, yeah, for the big outlets, when they give a call, like, of course, Disney is going to respond to them. But for the smaller places, I'm like, ah, it, it, it's not that easy. Like, I feel like there's something to be said for these internet writers, reporters, bloggers that are trying to create a space where they can really talk about film and entertainment but they're not being heard in that same way, whereas like an EW would be. So yes, if you want to do your job, try every outlet that you can. And maybe in those articles, they should have said, I reached out to Disney yeah. and no one responded because yeah. that sometimes comes out. Um, so that's the part of it where I'm like, okay, he makes it sound very simple, but I would guarantee that there are some outlets that tried to call and tried to get a response and got nothing from them. Um, and two, I think the interesting part of it is where you were talking about earlier, John, just the fact that there is a lot of, BS stuff going around in here. His comments to me are so un Disney polished, <laughs> which makes me believe that like he is really saying this stuff from the heart where it's not like Disney contacted him and said, this is the story that we're going with. Like, please just support us in this. It was one of those things where he's like, this is a director who's young and I'm working with him. Maybe not, maybe yes, maybe a little. <laughs> um, but he decided to come out and say this stuff because I mean, if Disney was behind any of this, it would shock me. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's the part of it that I really like. Pablo Hidalgo told me. So Pablo is definitely <laughs> Pablo, a Pablo, yeah. Pablo yeah. 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 yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, this is amazing stuff. All right. What's next? <laughs> All right. So moving off of Rogue One, uh, let's talk about Episode 8 being in the home stretch. Uh, this is according to Star Wars News Not Dead. Again, Star Wars Episode 8 director Ryan Johnson has announced that principal photography in Episode 8 is nearly finished by posting this awesome image on Twitter. That's my embellishment uh, on Twitter and Tumblr accounts. The next chapter of the Star Wars saga continues the epic journey of Ray, Finn, and Poe as they take on Kylo Ren in the First Order. The film's been shooting at Pinewood Studios outside of London for the past several months. So he posted, as I said, this beautiful image that looks like the cloak of Luke Skywalker with part of the set recreating the planet of Octo in the background. The director also noticed that the film is in its final stages of filming. What do you think about this very dirty Luke Skywalker cloak and this cliff in the background, Christian? Does this say anything to you since we already know Luke and Leia survive? According to Claude and Trevor on episode nine, uh, absolutely not. Uh, there's, there, there's, nothing, there's, there's nothing about it. It's just cool. So you got to see the cool. You get, you get to see the robe. You got to see the kind of atmosphere and the more locations that we're going to see. But is the picture anything to get excited about? No. It's it's like something when you're walking through celebration, you see the robe in a kind of a glass case. Cool. That's the robe that Luke wore. It's not about that. It's, the, the story is the home stretch. The story is the fact that they're on course and that they pretty much are on course from where they were supposed to be, even when they were going to release the movie in May, but now they have a little bit more time in post. It's great. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to what John said when we were talking about The Force Awakens, is that it's just more real. Mm -hmm. We're going to see episode eight in about a year and a half. That's awesome. Now, if we're seeing episode eight after seeing a great standalone film or one that we want to forget, we'll figure that out in a couple of months. But as far as this goes, this is really cool. Speaking of Star Wars, um, StarWarsNewsNet.com, by the way, not only do they, we get a lot of stories from them, they take a bunch of stories that they put together. Star Wars NewsNet should, um, they, they just put a big spoiler, uh, a rumored spoiler. Mm. I'm not gonna say what it is, I'm gonna give people the option of going and checking it out, but it's something that happens in apparently in episode eight. So if you want to go and check it out, you've been forewarned. The article is up there if you want to check it out. But um, yeah, so to me, this is pretty cool that we're getting close. And then Ryan Johnson's been a cool marketer of this movie too. 
Um, I, I agree. I mean, it's a really cool picture. M my first thought was, why would you ever take the cape off? <laughs> 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 like, I pressed. would be the person on set that's like, can I just try it on for just a second? Like, can I just walk over there and just like, no one's going to notice, right? Um, and then I'd like drop it on the ground and that's probably why it would get even more dirty. Uh, so I think, yeah, I mean, it's cool. We're getting to see it on the set. I don't think it shows anything different even than what we saw at the end of The Force Awakens. Um, right. I know that he's been out in wherever getting dirty in that like mm. cloak of his. So it's really cool. Do I want to be there? That's what's more about it for me. Looking at the picture, I'm like, I just want to be next to it. Yeah, bro. Oh uh, yeah, I think it's a great picture, and uh, let me apologize if I've said Star. If I haven't said Star Wars News Net .com, I want to make sure that's clear. I, that's who I meant every time I've said that. Um, yeah, I think the picture is great. I think it's a good combination of the fact that you have a boom mic, you have a stand mm -hmm. for a camera, and you have an apple crate. I think it's what's called apple crate or whatever mm -hmm. it's called, the box that they use there. Uh, and then you have the robe. So all it's it's a way of, sh of a shout out to all the different uh, parts of uh, of a film. You know, so I think it's perfect. It un you understand it's a film that's being shot, but you also understand this costume that makes you excited to come and watch the film and that character that you've loved so much for so long mm -hmm. so to me i think it hit all the right notes and it was a nice little like here you go and then you can like oh and then move on that's what i felt TV? utterly useless yeah <laughs> it's a it's a useless picture <laughs> who cares oh we never knew that cape was gonna be in the movie yeah we or did. that it was and gonna rocks. be dirty or gonna be rocks yeah. or that it was gonna be dirty no but but you're, you're tweet, all terrible people yeah. the tweet though <laughs> The tweet is not useless right. uh -huh. because yes. when, when he says something, when he says in the home stretch, when you're talking about the stuff that makes more real, the term that, mm -hmm. that I kind of made up, <laughs> that I made up and, and still use in a very ignorant way is the tangibilization, the tangibilization of episode eight, that it's yeah. real. It's almost mm -hmm. there that we are now so close. We're just two or three months away from when they start reshoots and all the rumors about the disaster that episode eight is in start c coming out as well. But no, I love the tweet, but the picture is who cares? <laughs> I want to know what's around the edges too. Yeah, like what got cropped out? Because there's probably some spoilers in if that. If you kept yeah. an apple box in there, what did you crop out? Lando, cat wrapper on the ground or something. Um, I don't know what that action was that you were just doing. Yeah, I guess he's that's a little more smooth. Yeah, than that. Be <laughs> like JT. So, All right, what's next? Yeah, <laughs> All right, uh, so we have come to the end of the domestic run of the Force Awakens. Uh, this is coming from the uh, from StarWarsNewsNet.com. Last week, after a six month run in US theaters. Star Wars The Force Awakens completed its run at a hall, a domestic hall of $936 million, which secure, which put it at the top of the charts, at least for a while, with an approximately of $160 million over Avatar. But worldwide, it made $2.066 billion. That's pretty amazing. It did not quite catch Titanic at $2.187 billion or Avatar, $2.78 billion, billion. I mean, $2.788 <laughs> billion. Billion, billion. <laughs> billion, billion, billion. Billion, yeah. billion. Zillions. Uh, the sequels tend to do... The, now, the, people are this is people are saying that it's because the foreign markets are a little bit lower, meaning that the interest in Star Wars isn't as high as it is domestically, and there's they're saying that, well, do are the sequels going to meet the level to which Force Awakens did? Because sequels tend not to meet the level of money-wise that their original counterparts do. Uh, so does this mean the, because it's only number three worldwide. Do you think, Christian, this that they won't pass Avatar and they won't pass Titanic? No, this? there was a day where I thought that um, that it would, but it, it's it's too hard now to be able to do it. I mean, maybe down the line, if they start doing some kind of even with marathons and re-releases, it, it just doesn't seem possible that it'll catch it. But I think that the 936 million is a completely underrated stat. Yeah. No movie no, domestic. It's insane. It's an insane yeah. stat. No movie domestically. Like it's far surpassed Avatar in dom on a domestic run. I don't know if any movie is going to be able to catch that in a very long time. Even a Star Wars movie, because of the points that we've made in the past on this show, also is that the hype between any other Star Wars movie is not going to meet the hype that The Force Awakens did for Star Wars. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But 936 million on a domestic run is a earth-shattering number. Yeah. It is a number that is, it, it is like Babe Ruth type stuff. It, it is, it's amazing for what this movie did in a domestic run. Now, even on a worldwide, it's number three? Yeah. It's number three. I mean, yeah, yeah. Right? All the movies <laughs> that are made in the world, it is number three. Yeah. It's a, it was a nice, nice run, and um, this is a big number, John. 
I, I just remember there being certain members of this panel looking at me like I was drinking a bottle of horse piss when I said <laughs> that The Force Awakens will not catch Avatar and it will not catch Titanic sure, worldwide. Yeah. And you guys looked at me like I was crazy. I don't know. Like I was some I don't kind drink of yellow water all the time. No. <laughs> um, Sometimes. But, but you're, you're Grandma's right. Peach tree. To, to downplay, and that is the funny thing, when some people hear that worldwide, Star Wars Force Awakens made two plus billion dollars, but it didn't catch Titanic, didn't catch Avatar. And the first question is says, well, what went wrong? <laughs> Nothing went wrong. That is an outstanding achievement. Only mm. happened twice in cinematic history before that a movie would hit two billion dollars world. I think only about, I don't even know if 20 films in history have hit one billion dollars, let alone two billion dollars yeah. that is nuts and you cannot underestimate how huge of a deal that domestic number is 936 million dollars domestically that doesn't just beat that blows away yeah. avatar's number of 760 million dollars that destroys titanic's third place number 600 and some odd million dollars that result is huge i'm going to tell you this right now i don't know if rogue one is going to be a fantastic movie i don't know if it's going to be a bag of crap i'm going to tell you this if it's fantastic, if Rogue One is fantastic, if Rogue One can follow up Star Wars The Force Awakens as a fantastic film, I'm gonna tell you this right now, Star Wars Episode Eight will beat The Force Awakens numbers. It wow. will beat The Force Awakens you think? numbers. Yes, wow. if Rogue One is, is lauded by critics and fans, regardless of how much money it makes at the box office, if the fans loved it and the critics loved it and it's an excellent movie, mm -hmm. I think Episode Eight, I think it'll ride that momentum and Episode Eight still won't beat Avatar, but it'll beat The Force Awakens. Interesting, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing. It made a ton of money, obviously. I think the biggest thing for me is that like, I can't believe it's been six months since we were all I know, waiting right? for the movie it to come like out. two yeah. months ago. Yeah, that, and we've been living in a world with The Force Awakens for the last six months, which is crazy um, and amazing and awesome. And now we're right on top of Rogue One coming out and talking about episode eight. Um, the interesting thing I think is, yes, from our perspective, we look at these numbers and we're like, man, like, how could you be upset about those at all? But I am curious to see what's going on on the business side of things if Disney is saying, okay, well, we didn't beat those numbers and we're not performing as well internationally as some other films have. What can we do in the next ones right. to change that? Because it's like, I mean, even you look at something like The Fast and Furious or Warcraft where it's like they're shooting more in China or they're bringing in actors from different places that I'm curious to see if they'll start thinking that way a little bit. If investors are gonna say, hey, how about we try and tweak this here so that we get a little more international viewers to come in and see this. That will be interesting to me. But again, it's like, that is an insane amount of money. And yes, John, I was one of the ones who said <laughs> it would officially totally me blow too. Avatar out of the water. Yeah. And it didn't. And I, it, it's interesting to me because not necessarily saying like, oh, it's a sad thing that it didn't make as much money. But I'm like, I am as a film goer kind of curious to be like, what is it about a film like Avatar that was so much more appealing or Titanic even because I mean Titanic to me is not as international of a story as Star Wars is to me so it's interesting when you look at those and you're like what is it for viewers like I would love to hear from fans across the world to be like well I really liked it because of XYZ but it also shows you what a feat it was for Avatar and Titanic oh, yeah. especially and from the Titanic same dude yes but man. especially Titanic for the year that it did it yeah. and the time that it came out and how much time it had to be able to do it uh, and then looking for as much people who crap on Avatar 2.7 I mean come yeah. on it was it was lightning in a bottle yeah. it was a perfect mm -hmm. storm with a lot of different else because the, the, the thing that really staggers me today is that it made so much money and yet today Avatar has almost been erased from the pop culture vernacular mm -hmm. you like I remember the first Halloween after mm -hmm. we talked about this the first Halloween after Avatar I saw tons of people dressed as Navi the second Halloween no none right. it was yeah. gone and people will still be dressing as Ray for a long time yeah, yeah exactly I still see people dressed up as Heath Ledger's Joker yeah, right. but the but Avatar has disappeared from the pop culture yeah. vernacular but it was a perfect storm for that one moment in time this is not and you talked about the concern about international interest I think what The Force Awakens has done has reestablished interest internationally mm -hmm. that's why I believe if Rogue One doesn't crap the bed and it might but if it doesn't I think Episode 8 is going to do better still going to have Vader 
Yeah. Yeah. All right. A couple things to say. First, uh, Star Wars News Net got these uh, figures from Box Office Mojo. So you want to give proper credit there. Box Office Mojo is a great place. I always go to them and read what they're doing and predicting with their films. Uh, here's the thing to tell you. I saw Titanic eight times in a the theater, so I can speak no, to you. No, you wow. didn't. Yes, I did. I and saw it three saw times in the theater. And I, I saw Avatar yeah. four times in the theaters. For me. Wait, what did you see eight times? Titanic. Titanic, Titanic okay. eight, okay. Uh, Avatar, Avatar four. four. Because at wow. the time, in 1998, when that film came out, I was going back to college as an, as an actor mm -hmm. and as a film And state. you saw it as a great place to pick up single moms. Totally. Or, well, just, or yes. just cry. I was 27, so male cry. cry. Yeah. But me, I was obsessed with the Titanic story. Obsessed with, uh, and it was at the time of the cultural zeitgeist when the entire pop culture. The world was fascinated yeah. yes. with, yeah. with the actual story of the real Titanic. Yeah, for whatever yeah. reason, they caught lightning in a bottle, like you were saying, John. Yeah, it was just that time. And for me, as a new student coming out of the military, going in to study film, going in to study acting, to watch that film, yes, maybe the writing wasn't so great. You can say that, absolutely. Uh, but the, the <laughs> filmmaking itself. Christian Faith. <laughs> what's wrong with the Titanic writing? Yes. But the, the, the filmmaking itself was phenomenal. As a Titanic lover, an obsessive fan of it, you the fact that they created the Titanic nine-tenths the actual size in Mexico, built that boat, and the fact that it was three hours and people kept coming. I think the reason these films are more successful to Star Wars, if you're going to even make a denigrating comment about that, is because they're more universal in terms of the themes of love and they're not necessarily what people would say a nerd geek property, right? It's more mainstream appeal in that approach. I love Star Wars, two pieces, but the reality is Avatar more about a relationship. Once again, Titanic, about a relationship. Yes, these are relationships in Star Wars, love stories, you know, all this stuff that goes on, absolutely, but it's set in something that you can relate to as a mainstream audience, right? On a boat, on a cruise ship, or on a planet when you're seeing native natives versus people coming in to try to colonize them. And so these are universal themes that we've seen in our history. Uh, so I think that's why they appeal more. And Cameron just, he just knows. Like, uh, it's very rare when Cameron missteps with any film he makes. So you, he just has a, a way to touch into what people want to see on screen over and over again. All right. I What's used next? to go see Titanic oh, and leave halfway through because I didn't want to see the end. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and let's, let's, don't spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> poor, <laughs> poor Billy Zane. We don't live in the heartthrob era anymore. Right. There yeah. aren't heartthrobs today the way they Good used point. to be. And, and Leo DiCaprio at the time. Now, today we think of him as one of the most respected actors right. in Hollywood. But at the time, he was not seen that. He right. was He's the, growing pains the kid. Great. teen magazine yeah. cover boy yeah. for five years yeah. straight. And he was at the height of his power at right. that time. Yeah. On top of everything, all the things you so accurately pointed out, yeah. it was it was a perfect storm. Yeah, it was. All right, what's next? All right, now let's move on to something that our own John Campia will have a very vested interest in. Ah, you ruined my joke. All right, oh, good. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, tell me before what? I introduce these stories. What? Mark Hamill is hosting a show on Comic-Con HQ, which... That sounds familiar. Yes, doesn't it, though? <laughs> well, if you've been wondering what Mark Hamill's been up to since finishing episode <laughs> eight, which apparently he might have just done, according to Star Wars News, uh, Star Wars News Net com, uh, he is starting a new reality TV series called Pop Culture Quest, which will debut this fall on Comic-Con HQ. The series will feature a documentary-type atmosphere that will involve real-life stories about fans and their amazing collections of memorabilia. Hamill's been collecting since the 70s. He said, quote, I've been a collector all my life. The show is a natural outgrowth of that passion. Now I have an opportunity to collect other people's collections. I can't wait to see what's out there and share it with the world. Collectibles are a living history of who and what we are, so we just might learn something, but there's no doubt we're going to have fun. Seth Latterman, uh, who is the GM at Comic-Con HQ, said he couldn't be more thrilled to have Mark involved. And if you want to go to Mark Hamill's Facebook page, there is a 20-second preview from Hamill himself about the show. Christian, are you interested to watch the show? And do you think it will appeal to non-collectors as well? Um, well, it's Mark Hamill right now. It's smart for them to, I think, just you want to tune in to him anyway to hear what he's saying. You go to the Star Wars fan base. And I do, I, I had the pleasure of speaking to him when he called in the Schmoes. And he's the nicest guy on the planet because he's so inviting. He's so inviting as a personality. You feel like you know him, and that's the way he comes across even when, what, what he's going to be like on this show. And you looked at the stuff he did for the Force for Change video alone. Mm -hmm. He can be interactive with fans. He will have this kind of, he does have a passion for collecting. So I think it's a very smart move mm -hmm. for them to do. And to speak on this, someone obviously that we know knows a lot about this, Cody. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 this joke still worked. All right, like, so. John, please tell us what you know, how, when you knew, and what you can uh, can say about it. Um, I've known for a while okay. and super excited about it. Because think about this: it's Mark Hamill, number one. There's that, but there's a reason shows like uh, uh, I almost said the wrong word. Uh, there's a reason why show, shows like. Um, 
uh, American Pickers or shows like um, Pawn Stars right. or shows like these are so people are fascinated mm-hmm. with collectible stuff. It, it seems to be universally a uh, universal. That's why things like uh, what's that one the American Roadshow mm-hmm. where they go Antiques out Roadshow. Antiques, Antiques Roadshow. Antiques Roadshow. Thank you so much. Yeah. While wow, these little things become like so amazingly popular with people, and to have somebody like a personality like Mark Hamill go around and actually looking at people who don't have items but have entire collections Mm -hmm, of things I think is absolutely fascinating and you know there's going to be more than one or two Star Wars collectible things in there as well look I am as somebody who's involved and has been involved with Comic Con HQ from the beginning, I'm very, very excited about this. You know, we, our show, uh, Film HQ, is number one show on, on Comic Con HQ, and I'm very happy to relinquish that to Mark Hamill uh, yeah. <laughs> for his new show. To, uh, I'll be very happy playing second place to that. I'm super excited. You'll be I'm the su- avatar to his Titanic. <laughs> yes, I'm more than happy. No, other way around. I yeah. will be the Titanic to yeah. his right. avatar. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm so thrilled with it, and I think the show is good because I love Pawn Stars and I love those collectible shows. To have him doing it specifically about stuff that matters to people like me I think it's going to be amazing and I'm very excited for it John yeah, uh, this is an interesting thing to me. I have a couple of friends who are in, who've been insane collectors since I met them in the '90s. I they had like just walls in their dormitory rooms back in college right. of just uh, unopened figures, and it was something that was very strange to me because I've never been a collector. I would buy toys when I was a kid. Still have those old Star Wars, the Land Speeder. Still have it. All those kinds of things. But like, I never was one to necessarily be a collector. But these Funko things have put the hook in me like crazy. The Black Series has put the hook in me so. As a visitor to this world, I find it fascinating to watch. Mm -hmm. My friend uh, Reigns, he has the Colonel Reigns toy chest down in Alabama. He now has made a whole business out of it. I knew him when he was just hanging stuff on the wall. Now he has a whole business down there that he does and has collects and showcases all the time. People who do this are very in love with what they do. Mm -hmm. And to me, I envy it because there's such an attention to detail and real, like they know what bull crap is and they know what real collectible stuff is. And Mm -hmm. it takes a certain kind of art to know that. So for me, I will watch just because it's Mark Hamill A, but also B <laughs> because to see these uh, the the level of detail and and uh, love that these people have. You know, I want to see I want to see Mark Hamill walk into a pawn shop. I want to, I want a secret camera to follow Mark Hamill around and have him pull something that he actually used on Star Wars oh, yeah. and pull oh, it out man. and then have somebody like, tell him it's fake. Yeah, <laughs> say really, yeah, I would right. love to see yeah. that. That'd be awesome. I think I mean I think it's really cool because also didn't he actually put into his contract that he wanted everything that had Luke on it sent to him? I feel oh, like I read that wow. somewhere. So it's like. I would be really interested, one, also to see what he has collected, because even looking yeah. at this photo, you've got one of the figures that his son has done, you've got Dark Knight stuff, obviously you've got Star Wars, music, magic, all right. kinds of stuff in there. So I'm curious to see, one, if they do something where it's like, he's been collecting X, Y, Z for this many years, so we start with that kind of stuff, or at some point get a look in that world of his. Um, but the other part of it that I find to be really interesting is, yes, the stuff and the collections are always really interesting, but. I got to go to one of the first episodes of DC All Access. We went to this guy's house who had the largest personal comic book collection. Right. Wow. And you go That'd to their awesome. house and you just kind of see everything and you talk to them and they have such interesting stories, mm-hmm. let alone all the cool stuff that they've collected, but just meeting the people and talking with them. And that's what I think is going to be so great about this show because there's some actors where, you know, they are personable, but they probably wouldn't have the greatest repartee with anybody in the middle of America who's collected stuff. But Mark comes across as the kind of guy that he's going to go to somebody's house and I bet you he sits and has dinner with them. And it's like Mm. you get that super connected interpersonal connection with Mark Hamill as Mark Hamill. And you're like, he's just a dude. He's not Luke Skywalker in that moment. It was my favorite moment because of uh, when I interviewed him because of what you just said. He's so invested Mm -hmm. and he's so he is listening to what you're saying. It's not just like, okay, what are you going to ask me next? He's like, I have and this is something I, I will take to my grave with me. I taught Mark Hamill about Star Wars canon on my show. The interview you can see, find the interview. It's it's it is like he was asking questions, and you see me light up I'm like whoa, 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 and I just geek yeah. out. But he legitimately was listening. It's like, well, wait a minute. So what does that mean for? Because he, you can't expect him to know everything that's happening mm. in the lore with uh, with Luke Skywalker. Some of it yeah. he yeah. does, some of it he doesn't. And so he and he says it. He's more of like he is a Marvel kind of or you know uh, comic book superhero type mm-hmm. of guy. But when it came to the canon, he wanted to learn about it. He was listening to me. He took things from it. And that's certainly what he's going to do with these collectors. So it's a great idea for a show. Okay. So now it is time for What's the Deal with Canon? <laughs> and 
That's that right. was an aggressive one today. <laughs> I was in yeah. that kind of mood. Time <laughs> for it was like a little bit of echo at the end. <laughs> Time for what's the deal, Rakan? This is everything happening in the world of Star Wars. That's not the movies, but related to the movies, books, <laughs> comic books, all that stuff. John, you're yep. going to bring up the comic books up top. I can tell you that both Vader came out and the Poe came out. Yes. I didn't get a chance to read. Did you read either I one? I read Poe. Okay, good. great. Yeah. Okay, Would so you tell us about Poe. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Edgar Allan? Yeah. Yeah. Edgar Allan Poe. Well, <laughs> there was a rapping. Um, so Poe, the comic book. I, I enjoy the art so much in this. If you haven't picked it up, the first two issues, it's very... It's interesting because it's filling in the blanks for stuff. It can't really go to totally new places. So I have to say the first two issues for me, especially the first one, I loved it so much because you got to get to know a little bit more about the different characters on his team. This one for me, throughout the first three issues, it's kind of like a wrapping up of the initial story where they've got this egg, they're trying to get it somewhere without it opening. The first order comes into the picture. I'm not gonna spoil what happens in this issue. But I will say, this one was not the strongest of the three for me. Okay. Um, so I'm hoping that this continues and they can kind of delve into other places. The interesting part about this one is the fact that it is, I feel like as writers, they're so restricted with what they can do because of the fact that they're dealing with a very specific time with Poe and you know where he ends up. Um, so the one thing I will say that I love so much about this though is the artwork. The artwork in this series has been so fantastic and such great detail. Even you can just see in the background shot that we've got there, but it looks, when you do something based off of a character from a film, I want the character to look like the person. And it looks so much like Oscar Isaacs. And when you're just doing the like different lines in the faces, you can see so much emotion in there. So for me, the artwork is the standout in the Poe Dameron comic book series. I hope that the story gets a little bit stronger, but like I said, it's interesting because I would say it's almost like they're going on different little quests here and there, so I don't know where they're gonna go with this one, um, but that's how I felt about the third one. Not my favorite, first one I really enjoyed, hoping for more in the next ones. It's uh, interesting to see Tom Hardy reprise his role as Bronson in, yeah, right? in this um, as well. So yeah, Poe number three is in stores now, and Darth Vader number 21 is also in stores, and I'm gonna read both of them. Hopefully, you know, I'll try to get my thoughts on those next week, but thank you, Tiffany, for mm -hmm. giving yeah. us a review of Poe number three. All right, we skipped a story. John, what yeah. did we miss? Yeah, we missed uh, this interview with Tim Azion. By the way, shout out to Greg Grumberg showing up there. It's pretty awesome. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, we had an interview with Tim Az Timothy Zahn was at AwesomeCon, uh, and he was asked a number of things during a Q&A session about, uh, a num about his character showing up in canon, about the canon wipe that happened that created Legends. Uh, what did you, and there was also talk about uh, the different characters that might show up, and his feelings about Star Wars 7, uh, The Force Awakens, right, Christian? Uh, what did you think of all of Zahn's comments and do his comments mean we won't be seeing him in the Star Wars universe anytime soon because he gave some, he gave some pretty strong statements about Kylo Ren, Thrawn, and, I mean, sorry, not Thrawn, uh, 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 Phasma and Hux. That he didn't, mm -hmm. I mean, that he wasn't a fan? That he was not, no, he said that, the, he said with Kylo Ren, he thought he was not a good warrior and that Thrawn would have him for lunch. Not this a strong exact, villain, not yeah. a strong villain and Thrawn would have him for lunch. He said that Captain Phasma was underserved. He said General Hex was, Hux was okay, but he was missing some elements. I hope that they don't, um, you know, punish him for that. I. I think that that's the kind of reason that you hire Timothy Zahn in the first place is for his voice and the things and for he, I think that he can prove he, he's proved that he has written some fascinating characters in the past so I think it would be a bit petty if they they, they kind of cut their nose off despite the face you know if, if they're gonna do well because he said that about Kylo Ren and Hawks uh, he is he's not gonna write any more canon books that would be silly so yeah. I, I think that he, I, eventually I think it's gonna be a big thing when he comes back now whether or not it's gonna be sooner than later I don't know but I found the interview fascinating because there was um, the, the, the the question as far as how would you feel if Thrawn Mara or any of your characters showed up in Rebels and he said how do I put this yes I would love something of mine to show up in Rebels Rogue One or the mm -hmm. movies I think my right. stuff would translate well I think we all agree there even if it's in a passing reference at the end of The Force Awakens I was speculating about a grand battle to take uh, part at the end of the trilogy where they say something along the lines of we beat Palpatine we beat Thrawn and we can beat this guy and then they talked about the cannon wipe the cannon wipe part was the stuff mm -hmm. that yeah. and again this whole article is on um, Star Wars News Net if you want to kind of catch a, an idea of what he was talking about here with the cannon wipe because I liked the where he was understanding why they did the wipe 
and it also there's he, there's also things that I understand that he said about the wife to where if they wanted to they could have went and said no this particular story is canon this one isn't this one is not instead of just wiping the whole thing but then he said but by doing that they would have to know where the franchise is going mm-hmm. for the next 20 or 30 years and th- you would assume that they don't. and leave no flexibility right mm-hmm. so he it's like one of these things that he and the fact that he's calling the the fact they call it legends didn't really sit that great with them but he gets it it's like a guy who understands the business understands what it's all about but still it's just like yeah it was a it was a shot in the chin but i'm still fighting it was one of those mm-hmm. things so i love the interview with him i really think that it would also benefit them to get him to write another story because the second he does you know that's gonna be one of their top mm-hmm. sellers and a great marketing tool um uh, tiffany what do you think uh, I the stuff that he talked about, you know, about the legend stuff is what really stood out to me. Where he compared kind of the storylines to things that you hear about King Arthur and mm-hmm. Robin Hood, where it's like stories have been passed around and changed and tweaked, and mm-hmm. they're things that you know to be true. But even where it was like uh, Filoni tweeted the thing where it's like there's some truth in legends, and it's like the spine of one of the books. Um, so I think that it's I totally where he's saying they could have chosen stuff as worried as we get sometimes that they're going to mess stuff up and it's going to get all murky when they're saying this is true this is not if they had gone through and cherry picked and said this is true this right. is not <laughs> this is yes this is no confusing it would be yeah. so confusing yeah. because i'm like i still have people now that are like wait that's not canon or is this canon and i'm like they did a pretty cut and dry like from here on out this is canon kind of thing right. um so i think that you know disney as a whole obviously know what they're doing where it's like we're going to try and not make this even murkier water than it needs to be. Right. Um, I like the fact that he is so outspoken and is just kind of like, this is how I feel about these characters. I don't really like this character. I mean, he wrote one of the strongest characters that we all talk about wanting mm. to show up somehow in the film. So I think that he definitely comes More from a place one. where, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but comes from a place where it's like he can vocalize this and. Like you said, Christian, I don't think they're going to be like, stop talking right. <laughs> like because the fans would be in an uproar. They're, like, again, it's where, you know, Macquarie was saying stuff and you're like, you respect him more because he doesn't have a filter about talking about this kind of stuff. And he really just shares where he's at. And he is a fan as well. And I think that, you know, as he's saying all this stuff, characters showing up in Rebels, I cannot wait for that to happen. So. Roger? Yeah, I mean, I love this because he does that because he does he doesn't have to be under the Disney uh, umbrella. He can say as he as he wishes, and I think you're right, Tiffany, bringing up McCoy. That's a great comparison because he's just going to say what he thinks is correct, and he does bring it around when he's talking about the cannon wipe. Mm-hmm. One of his quotes is says so the he says they are saying we can make any of this back into canon at any time. So the best of their options is set up. Bear in mind they have people like Pablo Hidalgo, Dave Filoni, and Kathleen Kennedy who have an extreme love for the Star Wars universe. So he understands. He respects them and their love of Star Wars. He just has a little bit, I think you're right, I think he took it on the chin to have his stuff wiped out to a degree and not be part of canon and have to wait to be part of canon when they decide it's part of canon. That He's an author, he's an artist. I would also be uh, upset too if I created these amazing characters that people love to death and I was told they'll come when we're ready to bring them in. So he, I think he has a right to say as he wishes and mm-hmm. I think we as fans enjoy that. I think you're right about that. And it's me. like we also don't know what happened behind the scenes. Like yeah. they, they could have come to him at some point right. and been like you're our guy like we love you so much we love the stories you did and mm-hmm. then it's like this whole new regime comes in and it's like we're actually not going to use any of that stuff right. that you did <laughs> so t- right. taking it on the chin the best way to the, the best way that he can can you imagine how confusing it would have been though if they said okay so Plagueis, yes. Rogue Squadron, <laughs> book three, six, yeah. nine, and twelve. But forget canon. chapter. But forget chapter the last chapter. Books one, two, four, and five, not canon. I mean, that's essentially what he would have been. Look to me, what he said as far as the, the criticisms go, right? I don't think anything that he said was unfair. Mm-mm. Look, would Kylo Ren have stood up to Luke Skywalker? No, he would have been smoked in a second. Would he have stood up to Grand Admiral Thrawn? No, Thrawn would have outthought it and had him be. I don't think he's throughout that. Is there anybody who disagrees with him that thinks Phasma wasn't underused? Right. Mm. Of course, everybody thinks mm-hmm. that. To me, though, the greatest what the hell question floating around the Star Wars universe right now mm-hmm. is how is the greatest novel writer in Star Wars history not writing in the new canon right now? Right. All due respect to the great writers mm-hmm. who are mm-hmm. writing some spectacular stuff right now. 
It's Zahn. Zahn's the guy we want yeah. writing. Zahn's the guy who's got to get back into this universe. Do what you need to do. Get him back involved. Because you're right. The moment they announce Timothy Zahn is writing one of the new canon Star Wars books, it's not going to be one of their most successful books. Yeah. It's going to blow everything else away as far as sales go. Yeah. They need to get him involved. Maybe there's a strategy behind it, too. Hope so. Maybe there's, maybe there's something. Maybe there's characters that are they're sitting back. And like you said, we don't know the behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Maybe there has been a meeting. To where they're sitting and they say, listen, we want to bring this character in, but we're waiting to do it to introduce them in Rebels or somewhere else mm. as soon as we do. What if Thrawn, if Thrawn shows up in Rebels and then season they're like, three, go. that's what I mean. <laughs> because season three of Rebels, there's been rumors that a Legends character, this is where all that stemmed Full from. Right. Yes. Yeah. So let's say it's Mara Jade, or let's say it's Thrawn, or anybody from Azan, Azan. then it's like, okay, go like you said now now do it then you can really start to promote it so yep. uh okay what's next yeah this coming that was coming from star wars news .net. if you they have clips of this q a if you want to listen to it you cool. can listen to their resistance broadcast podcast hosted hosted by chaos at chaos bria at toss station let's so, end with go. this story here okay. coming up this there next one all right yeah. this one comes also from star wars news .net, but way of ea electronic arts they are doing the new game uh let me get to it real quick sorry about the delay here yes jade raymond best known for producing the original Assassin's Creed is currently leading an initiative to hire as many as 27 developers for the movie, for the Motive Studios and Visceral Studios divisions of EA. She outlines the initiative as a way to assist in developing the Amy Hennig led Star Wars project as production on the game kicks into gear. She said, quote, last year I wrote that the only limitation we have as game developers is the team's imagination. The team at Visceral Games is forging ahead into an exciting phase of development. Seeing Amy Hennig lead this team through the creative process has been incredible. She's a rare breed of storyteller, and she's collaborating with the creative leaders at Lucasfilm to tell a new, authentic Star Wars story, backed by the talented Visceral team. Amy and Studio GM Scott Probst are taking this project in groundbreaking directions. Christian, do her comments get you excited for the game? Because we've been waiting a long time for this game. I don't know yet. Okay. I don't know yet because I just like I don't. I haven't gotten a new canon game yet. I've been. They've been talked about. They've been teased. Like, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. But it's not here yet. And that's fine. We're patient. We've been patient. We have a, we have tons of stuff. We have games. We I mean, we, excuse me. We have books. We have comic books. We have the movies. We have all these things that we can really have our uh, Star Wars appetite full. But I just uh, I'm not getting excited until I see a trailer, and even then, until I get some gameplay. Because I had a pretty cool trailer with with Battlefront. Thought it was fine. You know, and then I, I, it looked cool. Mm -hmm. So until I see what the actual thing is and what it's going to play into, I still think we'll play into the Han Solo story. But Camp, are you, is this, are you excited at all? Nope. No. <laughs> it's uh, not to say that the game won't be great. Not to say that. Not to say that fantastic things aren't coming. Yeah. But this is is what you expect to hear at this point. This is cookie cutter. Release the statement. Blah 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 kind of stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with it at all. Mm. But we've just seen enough. It's no. It's not worth getting excited about at this point yet. Right. Tiff. I mean, two things. One, it gets me excited that they're bringing in so many people because this is going to be an undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, but two, I mean, E3 is next week. So it's like this story coming out now makes me curious to think, OK, if they can start talking about this. Are we possibly going to get something we're not expecting at E3? Mm. Are they going to announce some things there? I really hope so. I think it would be great if we even just heard, like like you are saying, Christian, if you think it's a Han Solo connected right. story, where it's like, we're going to get some info about that. So I'm. it just made me excited to say, okay, next week, let's see what happens. Yeah, the statement gets me a little bit excited. I think what Tiffany said is correct. The fact that they're bringing this many people on to let you know that this is the kind of t attention to detail they're going to give this game and they're going to make it an extensive game. I interviewed Todd Stashwick on Cast of Characters, one of my old podcasts that you can find on iTunes with Yuri Lowenthal, and he is uh, on this team. He is one of the writers. He's been helping Amy with the development. He was one of the voices on uh, uh, on uh, Uncharted, and so he he has. she asked him to come on as an, to offer input and to help to write the story. What he was able to tell us just on that podcast got me super excited. So to see that this is finally kicking into gear, I'm incredibly excited to see what we get because it's not going to be Battlefront. I know that. Right. It's going to so be more story. It's going to be more story, yeah. which sure. is what I, I'm dying for. So. All right. Now we're going to move on to the point where we hear your voices. You guys have been sending in tweets, and it's time to hear what the hell you've been asking. John, they've been hashtagging. Hashtagging? Why not? <laughs> Hashtagging Collider Jedi Council. What have they been asking? Okay, this comes from Trevor at Trevorosaurus, which I think is pretty awesome. Uh, chances of Episode 8's title to be revealed at Celebration this summer. 
we discussed this on Movie Talk earlier today. Uh, you and I both yes, agree that it it's going to happen. Yeah. And I still think that it's going to be something associated with Knights of Ren. I actually would prefer it to be Episode 8, the Knights... Hell, that, was a, that was like a musical truck. <laughs> uh, episode yeah. 8, I think, The Knights of Ren would be very interesting. John, do you think we're going to get a title at Celebration? Nope. No. Right. Nope. Interesting. Uh, because, I, for, because it would be a good... What they do at the last Celebration, they announced the titles around Celebration. They didn't announce that because they already are going to own the new cycle when Celebration is going out. Mm -hmm. So why fire off a bullet during that time when you can actually hold on to it for another time? I actually wouldn't be surprised if we found out what the titles before Celebration, to be honest with you. But I don't think Celebration is where they're going to reveal it wasn't a big reveal, I mean, like an event mm -hmm. for Force Awakens. It just kind of came out, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. they just kind of released yeah. it. They did the same thing with Rogue One. Um, I th So I don't think they're actually going to release the hmm. title for it. I think well, not, not at Celebration. What do you think, Tiff? Um, I'm going to have to line more up with John on this one. What? I feel like, I know, <laughs> it's a rare day. It's a rare day. Um, I, I just feel like it's the same thing you're saying, where it's like there they are going to be so many stories coming out of Celebration whether it's just an actor showing up, they don't need to do the title right now if right. they want to keep people talking about it. I mean, honestly, it's like, okay, we could do Star Wars Celebration. I wouldn't even be surprised if something came out at Comic-Con, if it's like, yeah. we've been dominating Celebration this weekend before, Let's now keep we're it gonna going and be like, oh, sorry, yeah. guys. Like, I know you were all excited that's about everything brilliant. else. I didn't it even think about that. That's interesting. That's brilliant. Yeah, I mean, they did They did announce Revenge of the Sith, the title, at Comic-Con. I think it was 2004. Mm -hmm. So it, it, they've certainly done it in the past. But I still think they're gonna. you're going to get a lot of stuff. Uh, tons of stuff. Tons of stuff. A celebration. I think oh, the title is one of them. I think the title is one of them. Yeah. Okay. I love this uh, Black Widow Iron Man moment we just had. He's <laughs> <laughs> agreeing with. Uh, you know, yeah, I think the title will. <laughs> and I think for no other reason. It may, I may be stupid to say this in way out in left field, but with all this drama going on about Rogue One, yeah. what a better way to swerve the title a little bit more is to release a title, get people back excited for episode eight. Even though I know we're all excited, but give it a title. It kind of you know kind of makes a good feeling put out there and so and once again maybe completely wrong but i think it wouldn't be bad pr to do that in my personal opinion all right what's next all right Car uh, kai peterson at kai cp4 christian harloff do you think we'll see events in solo film that make han become scoundrelly or was he born mm -hmm. that way uh, yeah, of course you're going to see. There's something that's happening. There's been rumors about that they were going to put his brother in there, and there's be some family stuff. And we got to find. I mean, in Legends, we were just talking about Legends that he was part of the Imperial Guard. You know, he was part of. He was he was there, and he um, he kind of was went rogue. Now, whether or not they do that this time around, I don't know. I think we're definitely going to show his relationship with Chewie and why he got into the things he did. So, yeah, I think I think we will. And it'll be very interesting to find those things out. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we saw Sana Solo in the comics. Uh, I mean, this, so anything is possible at this point that they can play with in his history. Right. So, yeah, of course he'll be scheduled. I mean, why do Solo? He's going to be all like a church boy? No, no one wants that. I mean, yeah, I think it's going to be fun. I don't think it's from birth. I don't think anyone's scheduled from birth. But certainly <laughs> there's going to be reasons. I think there's yeah. going to be. I think we're going to find reasons for why he was. And maybe it does occur very young in his life but i certainly think that we're going to see reasons for why smith lord I, yeah i mean i think we're going to get the story of how he becomes who he is why he kind of and i don't know if it's necessarily that he's super scoundrelly it's mm -hmm. more that like he's closed himself off emotionally mm -hmm. from people right and so it's like something probably will happen in that movie that shows why much in the same way that reading a new dawn you get to see kanan's backstory because Kanan's not a scoundrel in his heart, but it's like it, he went off on his own, didn't want to connect with people, did his own thing. And that's where I feel like that's the story with Han, too, where it's very much like he decides to go off by himself. And so it's why does he do that, one, and close himself off? And two, how does Chewie end up becoming the one dude that mm -hmm. he's like... Not dude, but you know what yeah, I mean. I <laughs> he's, a, he's, a dude. he's his dude. Yeah. <laughs> There's gonna be a scene in this movie where where Han takes a shirt off. He's changing shirts, and you see this tattoo on one side of his chest it says S F B Scoundrel from Birth. <laughs> now, he was also he had another tattoo that said Scoundrel till Death on the other side, but that's spelled out S T D, and he decided to take that one off. Oh on. my God. But No, Han Solo. How long everything. were you thinking of that joke, John? Just came up with it oh, actually. Oh dear God. So look, here's the thing. Every character evolves and changes and grows but not Han Solo Solo's gonna be a six year old kid swindling other kids out of their lunch money that's what Han Solo does <laughs> scoundrel from birth and you're just gonna see him developing his relationships that help mold him later you see that relationship with, with Chewie and other things like that but that core of who he is 
I think he's going to be that dude from the moment we meet him on screen. I really yeah. do. I hope so anyway. All right, what's next? One step ahead of the bad guys. All right, Dusty Pearson, at Dusty Pearson, said, do you expect more people to watch Rebels after Rogue One? N- not not because of Rogue One, no. I, don't, I think that if you're, you know, I don't know. First of all, I don't know how much of a tie-in there's going to be to Rebels at all, especially if there's going to be uh, 50% reshoots. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, I, 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 I don't 40, know. Just 40, just 40. Just heard it on 40. Collider, Jedi Council? <laughs> yes, but I, I don't know. Um, I don't think this would make, I think that more things that would happen is something like Celebration, if the, the, some, similar to what happened last year when they released those clips for the Siege of Lothal, people saw Vader kicking ass, and they were like, okay, maybe I will check out this yeah. this Rebels thing. I don't think that the movie, I think, I think, yeah, I just don't see that happening. What do you think? I feel like if they are trying to f- familyify the movie, there is a chance because if there's, I mean, we've talked about this that there is talk of character, a character being in a movie that's going to end up in Rebels or Rebels going into the movie world. Um, so I think if they're child proofing the movie, <laughs> that I think there's a chance. But if we're getting the war movie that I hope we're getting for Rogue One, then no, because that audience is not going to be the same. So I right. think it would be weird to be like, we're going to introduce a character in this epic war movie and then he's going to end up in Rebels. Other way around, maybe. Um, but no, I don't really think that it's going to be something that will draw a massive audience to go watch Rebels. John? It'll make no difference whatsoever. Yeah. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either. Mm. I think it all depends on who shows up yeah. in Rogue One. I mean, they, if they find if they, if they if they do reshoots and then slide in a Kane and slide in a, a Hera, slide in uh, even a Zeb, who knows? Yeah. You can definitely put Zeb in digitally, so it, it's certainly possible. Or a chopper, even you could have them just go by the screen and you yeah. like, who's that droid? And th- so there's little things they could do, but unless they show up, because it is the time frame, right? It is around the time frame. That's but a I think great that's point, m- though. But that to me is more like fan service to people who are already watching Rebels. Yes. Like I would be like, yes. yay! But it's not going to make somebody mm-hmm. be like, uh, my mom's not going to go. Who was that orange droid yeah. in hour three, the minute droid, five right. for a second? Yeah. However, if somebody, not that Kanan will show up, but if right. somebody shows up yeah. like one of the primary characters and kicks ass and is memorable, yeah. Yeah, not going to happen. But they're not going to do that. Yeah. Not going to happen. So, but if that happened, sure. then yes, that would help right. Rebels, I think, yep. because yeah. people are going to want to know about a cool character. Right. But I don't see it happening. Uh, all right, what's next? Okay, at uh, Will Netterville, at W Netterville, asks, when do you I think... I thought you said Netterville. Tiffany <laughs> 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 <Jimmy> Smith. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> camera on her. <laughs> he said nuts. All right. When do you think Lucasfilm will start producing canon material that takes place outside the episode's time period? Um, it's great. Mm. It's a great call. I mean, yeah. uh, I don't know. I mean, we're hoping that it's going to be the Old Republic at some point. Um, I want to see some stuff happen before episode one, actually. I want to see some more. Like, what's the actual canon that ties into episode mm-hmm. one like what mm-hmm. what is palpatine actually doing i thought i knew with the lucino novels but now i don't so what was happening there i'd like to see some stuff that happened before episode one or maybe even 20 like kind of what they're doing with the harry potter series like 70 80 years before episode one that could be interesting we have a lot of time mm-hmm. we think so let's uh i don't know when it'll happen but i don't think anywhere within the next five or ten years john agree Anybody else? Me? Yeah. Uh, I think they'll do a network. That's when I think they'll do it. I, I think for when me, they do network? when they do You're the network, pushing this network, they, I really want a Star Wars. Yeah. I, there's yeah. no logical reason not to have yeah. one. To me, it doesn't make any sense not to have one. Uh, you've got so much material. If the WWE can have a freaking network, we can have a network of Star Wars. So it, to me, yeah. like you, and they're producing original content all the time using older and newer wrestlers. So it's certainly possible with all the storylines and characters. If they start greenlighting a bunch of canon, mm-hmm. why not? Certainly a Star Wars network would make sense. At least a Netflix TV series now that they've signed that deal to kind of put their toe in the water about people's response to maybe a 10 episode kind of bloodline type show about the old republic or, or game of thrones type show and see how people uh, mm-hmm. respond to that to see if they I think that's when it starts to happen. You just got to give them a little more time because they got to build the goodwill back consistently enough so that we will feel confident watching something like that. Well, I think it's it's one of those things that they've got to wait and see about jumping around in times mm-hmm. because it's it, people who are fans of Star Wars even knowing like well where where does this one happen? Where I mean even for me sometimes when I'm reading the comics it's like hold on what part is this from? So it's like if in the cinematic world they're jumping around in different times in between all the films, I think that it it's going to be harder to bring in new audiences. So I think that something like I've said this a lot that I would love an Old Republic show yeah. on Netflix mm. or HBO, that kind of where it can be a little bit grittier. And I feel like that's something where people could be like, oh, this is part of the Star Wars world, but it's not necessarily like 
immediately affecting the movies that I'm going to see. Yeah. All right, let's do the last one. Okay, last one. This is from Frederick at Freddy239. What would you rather see? Uh, good timing. Knights yeah. of the Old Republic yeah. trilogy or a Ben Kenobi trilogy? Shocking enough, I'm going to say a Ben Kenobi trilogy. Mm. I'm going to still, I'm going to push mm -hmm. for, I think that the Old Republic would serve much better as a series. Now, whether that's Netflix or Amazon, I think that in, because the Old Republic as a whole for non- hardcore Star Wars sweaties, as Schnepp would say, um, it, it might be confusing to people. It, as where in Netflix, you could do a Game of Thrones type series for Netflix to where you really dive into the history of what the Old Republic is. I want to see Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, whether or not that has to be a trilogy, let's see how the first one kind of turns out. But with an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie with Jon Favreau at the helm, I think that that could be something very interesting, and I want to see McGregor come back. Can't you? Um, I don't want a Star Wars TV series to come in and dilute the, the universe. So, uh, However, surprisingly enough, I'm going to say the Obi-Wan uh, thing, which uh, you've actually changed my mind on over the past three or four months. Uh, I, I'm now on board with the idea of an Obi-Wan thing. I still would rather them see new original stuff, but I've got to admit that that time period, that empty time period now with Obi-Wan Kenobi, I would be fascinated to see what he was doing. That would, could be pretty cool. Tiff? I gotta say, I think that if we're going movie trilogy, Obi-Wan, especially for the fact that I would like for this to happen somewhat soon while Ewan McGregor is on board while he's still young enough to play the character. Mm. Because if it's one of those things that we keep waiting, keep waiting, keep waiting, and now he's too old to play the time period that we want to see. I don't know if he'll ever be that too old because he, he, you can always put him in. Like he's, If they waited 10 or 15 years, they could still do a movie with him if they wanted to. Because Yeah, you could, but it wouldn't be that time period that we're talking about. Well, he's, I mean, only I feel like he's only like, 45. He's only 45 years old. He's still yeah, got a lot of years before he gets to yeah. like Sir Ian McKellen. Ian McKellen. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait, <laughs> what? Ian you well, shall not take Obi-Wan Obi Obi was based on Gandalf. So yeah. 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 Um, So I think I would, I would say Obi-Wan sooner, and I I'm, I'm just going to keep saying it. I want an Old Republic series, and I want Filoni mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah, I'm with Tiffany. Uh, Old Republic series, for me, a trilogy, Ben Kenobi, because it's time we, we and I've said this numerous times, i said this on Jedi Council way back when, it's time to connect the prequels once and for all. The smarter, wa smartest way in is with Kenobi, Ewan McGregor. Mm -hmm. Everyone loves him in those trilogies. Whatever your opinion of the overall uh, uh, effect of those trilogies were, or worth of those trilogies are, Kenobi or Ewan McGregor is fantastic. So give him the tri <laughs> give him the trilogy to do. It's time. I want to see it. Also, I feel like what Marvel's doing with the characters that we don't know as well as far as Jessica Jones or Daredevil, where it's like we're gonna do a series over here, introduce you to these characters, kind of see how people react to them. The main characters, they're not doing that with. They're yeah. not doing like, let's do an Iron Man Netflix series. I mean, maybe it could happen down the line, but I think that's something that if they're already doing it over there, would be smart to stick to. Where it's like mm -hmm. characters we already know, keep them up on the big screen. Characters that we don't necessarily know that well, let's see how fans react to them and put them on a series. Yeah. All right, that's it. That's our show today. Thank you guys so much for joining us on Collider Jedi Council. If you want to try to get your tweets in next week, make sure you go over to Twitter and hashtag Collider Jedi Council. I'd like to thank the council that was joining me today. First, Roka Fett, where can they find you? Hey guys, you can always find me at The Roka Says, which is my homage to The Rock. See the shows that I'm hosting, shows I'm a guest on and be asked to be on, like this show, which thank you everyone for having me on. It's so much fun to always come on Collider Jedi Council. And also you can see me Sunday nights being one of the hosts for the Collider Game of Thrones recap show here on the Collider Network with Dennis Zhang, with Jonathan Moiko, and with the lovely Perry Nemiroff. Sitting next to him is the Smith Lord. Tiffany, where can they find you? Uh, you guys can find me on social media at Tiffany's Tweets. And tonight, actually, I am going to be hosting a Q&A with Slash and James Wan all about Conjuring 2. So make sure you head over to the Movie Clips Facebook page for that event going on. Um, and actually up on Movie Clips today is my interview with the cast of The Conjuring 2, which was terrifying. Really? I screamed a lot. So oh. check that out. <laughs> and you guys can always find me on DC All Access every week. John Campia, where can they find you? You guys can find me and my colleague, Mark Hamill, on uh, <laughs> Comic-Con HQ, www.comic-conhq.com. Sign up for your free trial right now. It's free until after Comic-Con this year. You can also follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. And for me, you can find me at Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram, and you can find me mopping the floor with Andy Signore tomorrow on the movie trivia Schmodown. Head on over to Collider, 2 p.m., 
It's going down. It's going to be a battle. Go and check it out. Thanks again, guys. I appreciate it. And also, by the time you're watching this, the Schmoes No Show will also be up around 7 p.m. PST. Go and check that out. Thank you guys so much. May the force be with you. Always. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.